to launch a campaign about food poverty in Hexham, we were, we were looking to actually have an umbrella organisation which embraced all sorts of different organisations who have <coughs> concerns about food poverty at their heart. And there is a lot of activity in, in Hexham and in the Tyne Valley around food poverty and we're hoping that this campaign will bring all sorts of people together. So on your chairs you've got some information about the other activities that are going on. There's a benefit concert, a piece of sculpture is going into the Abbey. So there's a whole range of activities to highlight this question about food poverty and the fact that although we are one of the richest countries in the world, it is a commonplace thing that people um, <coughs> refer to food poverty. So, f so food poverty is part of our daily lives now. And um, so we are aiming to raise awareness about this, to start discussions about how it's come <coughs> about, what we can do about it, and what the implications are. So, um, so just before I hand over to Sam from the Food Bank, I just want to um, illustrate something well, what I've just said really, and some of you will know that the Trussell Fund has just published its report on food poverty. Now the Trussell Fund is, is only responsible for under 50% of the food banks in this country and they're talking about 1 no, 109,309 emergency food packages were distributed by the Trussell Trust in 2015-16. So this is not a small issue and it's not going to go away and that signifies only 50 less than 50% of the activity of our food banks. So um, it was a timely report and if you can get a hold of it it makes very interesting reading. But I would like to introduce Sam Gilchrist from the Food Bank. Thanks Thank very much. Um, can I also start by thanking Penny, really very much appreciating everybody involved in getting this campaign together. Um, it's really good work, thank you, very much appreciated. Now, can everybody hear me okay? Do I need to stand up? Everybody see the screen okay? Great, I shall make a start. Um, before I say anything else, I just want to make an announcement. Tesco's are not opening a food bank in Hexham. <laughs> we work really closely with them, they're great partners. Uh, it was an error. <coughs> Trussell Trust accidentally sent out uh, an announcement to the local paper. Um, so don't worry everybody, if I haven't already sent you an email, I'm telling you now. <laughs> um, we work in partnership with Tesco, so our bins are staying there, the Trust of Trust, we're going to put some permanent bins in, but they're not. <laughs> right, let's get started. Um, I'm going to very much talk about the local picture, what we see at West Northumberland Food Bank. I'm not going to talk about national statistics, I want to give you an understanding of what your neighbours are going through. <coughs> Um, so, there's a number of reasons why people need to turn to food banks today, and I'm going to run through some of them with you. But I have to say, um, very recently we've seen a huge spike in low pay. That's people who just simply aren't earning enough money to be able to eat properly. I've given you that lesson case studies on all of your, your seats there to give you an understanding of some of the issues we're dealing with. So at the minute, 15% of the requests for help that we get are from people who are in work. I mean, we're working with um, a mum at the minute. She's got um, kids at home. She's working by a supermarket and watching other people's groceries go past on the, uh, the checkout and then she's having to come to the food bank to feed her own family. And that's, that's not a, you know, a rare example. We've got people on night shifts coming in in the morning to get somebody to be after they finish work. 
And the issue that we have in our local economy is people are getting really short hour contracts. So you might get you know, eight or 12 hours somewhere, but then that employer is expecting you to be available for the rest of the working week if they have any extra hours. Um, and I don't see that, that going away any time soon. However, overwhelmingly, it has been welfare reform. It's been this government's drive for austerity to um, ostensibly save money from the welfare bill, which is causing the greatest hardship that we see. Um, last year, just under half of the requests for help uh, from who were suffering from maybe as a benefit today or a benefit sanction. Um, to give you some idea of what it's like, when your money gets cut, when your benefit, your job seekers allowance is being sanctioned, it's largely because uh, people haven't kept what's called a claimant commitment. So we regularly meet people who may have missed an appointment because they're at a funeral or in hospital, or the buses were running late because of bad weather. And that has actually led to people getting their job seekers allowance stopped for usually about a month, but we've heard about cases of being people benefit being stopped for six months, even as much as three years. And it's horrible, it's really awful to see people in that position. It's dreadful to think that people have got no income coming in at all. Sometimes they've even got the gas and the electric on, and we have to give people food that they can eat straight out of the tin. Um, it's quite interesting, actually, when you see at a national level, welfare reforms <coughs> getting rolled out across the country, you wait for them to hit the Hexham Job Centre, and then you suddenly see a spike in demand. Uh, and the spike we're just starting to see at the minute is the rollout of universal credit, which had only rolled out here since February, and it was um, it was just for non household payments. It appears that we're seeing it rolling out to other people now, and we're already we're seeing the consequences of that when claims have gone wrong, uh, gone awry, and people have been left in a worse situation than they were to start with. <coughs> Um, so it's benefit sanctions, but also delays, and the delays really hit families the hardest when I notice them. Uh, particularly if there's been a change of circumstances in your household, like a threshold birthday, a child moving, maybe it's from uh, one school up to the next and they have to recalculate all the benefits or a partner may have moved in or moved out of the property. So for a lot of the families we support, it's often due to the fact that there's been a delay and people are left without the right amount of money for a number of weeks and possibly even months. I mean, this um, lady we helped last year, a single mum trying to set up her own business, they left her without child benefit for 18 months. Now it's hard enough, <laughs> you know, trying to set up a new business when you haven't got a lot of money and you're single, but you could, you know, not having your child benefit through for 18 months, and that was a downward administrative error. Um, so I just think the system's a shambles, to be honest with you at the minute. We really are seeing people struggling. Um, and we're also now really starting to see the effects of people who've got sickness and disability and what's happening with their benefits. Just in the last month alone, two-thirds of all the requests that we've had for help are from people who are currently receiving treatment for their mental and or physical health. Um, increasingly, we're seeing people who've been told that they've failed to attend a work capability assessment but then we hear from claimants that they never got the letter, or they simply couldn't afford to go, or they were actually just too ill to go. And if you don't go to your work capability assessment, that's it, you've got no money. We know, we had two people that came to us at the beginning of the year. A uh, gentleman had no money at all coming into his household for months, literally months. His friends were helping him, his family was helping him. I mean, again, that's because he didn't make it to his work capability assessment. In that particular case study there, I know somebody who was gravely ill in hospital and he got his benefit cut because he didn't send his sick note in. And it takes weeks to rectify things like that. It often leaves people in a very stark choice who have got sickness and disabilities ended up having to claim job seekers allowance even though they're far too unwell to work. And then you sort of, you know, claiming, you know, declaring yourself fit and able. Very difficult situation. Um, my colleague Jo, sitting at the back there, has been doing some work with the job centre uh, around the job seekers and asking people who have um, perhaps a, a sickness or a health problem 
And it's when people first claim you've got to put together a claim and commitment, which is you outlining what you're going to do to find work. And Joe spent a number of weeks working with the Job Centre on a leaflet to help work coaches understand that people have particular circumstances. And if you're only able to look for maybe six jobs a week, that should be down in a claim and commitment. If you have a fluctuating illness, they need to understand there may be days that you're not well enough. But that leaflet kind of went missing, didn't it, Joe? It So the next step was the leaflet should have been in the job centre. Not. Um, I'll tell you what else we noticed as well. Last year we did a little snapshot of our data, uh, very much along the lines we just talked about there, about people's particular <coughs> circumstances when they claim a job seekers allowance. And of course, given our area that we work in, we see a lot of people who live outside of the main towns. So we're talking about people maybe in Allendale, in Ovington, um, Hayden Bridge, and we were seeing twice as many benefit sanctions. Because simply people just haven't got the access to the resources to keep up their job searches. If they haven't got you call it, affordable, regular transport to get them into towns like Pudra and Hot Whistle and Hexham, where they can do job searches, they can get to a library for to use their computer. People in rural areas who haven't got reliable broadband so we've seen double the amount of benefit sanctions, quite clearly because people just haven't got access. Mm -hmm. And again, the leaflet that Joe was working on was asking job centre coaches to make sure when they get a new claimant, can you actually get in to sign on? But, um, we'll, we'll, find, we'll get that leaflet back out there at some point. So, some facts and figures. We've been going just about three years now, and in that three years, We've distributed 5,300 bags of food and other provisions. Now, other provisions could be things like nappies, loo roll. I mean, you can guarantee if people haven't got food in the house, they're not going to have any loo roll or washing powder. <coughs> we have met over 2,700 requests for help. Uh, we've helped at least 560 households. 273 of those are in Hexham. Are you surprised at that figure? <laughs> It is actually disproportionately high in Hexham because there's quite a, a big turnover of homeless people. So somebody could be in a household a few months, say, in a, one of our homeless projects at Stockgap, and then we'll move out and the next person will move in. So each person is a household. It's quite a transient population at times uh, in Hexham. Um, and also, so you see, eight, uh, 128 households in Prudder, 85 in Holt Whistle. That's uh, quite a surprise, isn't it, for such a small population? There really is a lot of need in Holt Whistle. And again, I think that's because people haven't got access to jobs in the way that they have them in Hexham. And, and the other, the other group of people, that 80 people, <coughs> who live outside of the main towns, that also includes some anonymous clients that we have through what was 6830, and we don't know their postcode and address and also people with no fixed abode. And we do have people with no fixed abode in Hexham. We certainly do. <coughs> Last year, um, we had a young man living in a tent on Time Green for weeks. Uh, he used to come in and eat with us during the day. So, how do we do it? Um, anybody that's familiar with us will know we've got a network of donation points in supermarkets, churches, um, workplaces, community centres, and we ask people to donate. Now, can you believe that figure? 58,000 pounds worth of food has been donated in the last three years. Because it's a very easy and direct thing to do, you can really help out just by donating a tin of soup or some pasta.